you're out on the field at soccer when suddenly, out of the blue, your boss, he freaks out. Your friend opens up. Your kid breaks down. You, whatever, fill in the blank. Guess what? Jesus had those days too. His response should be our response. Let's meet the intentional Jesus. What a great service so far, huh? Yeah, I agree. Just close in prayer, right? Let's go home. Go home. It can't get any better than that. Go home. But anyway, I have a few things that I would like to share with you. Raise your hand if you need a copy of the outline. First of all, Victorville, you showed up. Thank you. You guys, give yourself a hand. Come on. Props to you. Not too much. You get a big head. It's just good that you're here. I want to also welcome the other sites over in uh, Hesperia and Phelan in Apple Valley. Always a blessing to have the whole church family come together for this part of our service each weekend. If you need, uh, you need a Bible, we got those too. But we want you, if you have your Bibles, uh, we want you to turn to Mark chapter 6. We're going to talk about a story, a famous story. How many of you, of you have heard the phrase, the feeding of the 5,000 before? Raise your hand, please. Okay, how many of you have read that story in the Bible? It's great. Put your hand down. Reason, there's a reason why. It's famous. That's why you've heard of it. That's why you've read it. Um, the Gospels are four photo albums. That's how I help people understand why we have different descriptions of Jesus' life and ministry. That's what the four Gospels are. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are narratives, accounts of the life of Christ. There's a little bit about his early life, but for the most part, uh, the guys that wrote those books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all focused on those three to three and a half years of ministry between his baptism, Jesus' baptism, and his ascension to heaven after he died and rose uh, alive from the grave and then ascended to the Father. So that's what those stories are. But it's, it's a little bit like if you and I decided we were going to go on the same vacation and we all took our cameras, right, our cell phones or whatever you have, and every time we went, let's say four of us took a trip together, and every time we made a stop, you know, the, the vehicle stopped and we got out and we started taking pictures of what we felt were the most interesting events or landmarks. Um, we might record some of the conversation that takes place over the course of the journey. Well, when we got home, we'd put together a photo album. Now, for those of you who are under 20, a photo album is <laughs> where you take a book and you actually make those digital pictures that you have show up on a piece of paper and then you put those in your album. So when you get home now, you've got this photo album of our trip and all of those pictures reflect what you thought were important or interesting um, that you wanted to show people when you got home. Okay, so the Gospels are like four photo albums, all right? And every one of those guys writes down the things that for their particular audience they think will be compelling or interesting or helpful to the message explaining the life of Christ. But they're all different because everybody is is seeing the world a little differently. And the Holy Spirit used those differences to give us a composite of what Jesus' life was like. Now, no photo album is an exhaustive description of everything that took place. And when you put them all together, it doesn't give us pictures of everything that happened. There many, are many things that took place in the life of Christ that we have no record of. Okay, why do I tell you all this? There's one picture that shows up in all four of our albums. And that's the feeding of the 5,000. It's the only miracle that all four guys decided to include in their photo album. Now, that in and of itself tells me it must be a pretty important miracle. And why, when I ask the question, how many of you have heard or have read uh, that particular story, virtually everyone raises their hands. One of the most famous stories in the entire Bible. Well, what I want to do is I want... That's really where we're landing today. 
I, I want to give you some ideas about what you know, we can take out of that story. Uh, but I want to back up, and I want to go all the way back to the beginning of Mark chapter 6. Not the very beginning, but toward the beginning of Mark chapter 6, because I want to set up that event, that miracle, when God, um, when Jesus, same thing, um, fed those 5,000 men, which actually means it was probably more like 10 or 12,000 people that he, he fed that day. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But I want to back up, and I want us to see three things about Jesus. Before we even get to the story, because it's very important to understand it all, maybe a little better. Now, one of the problems with me is that you get a boatload of things, especially when I've been gone for a couple of weeks. I'm just so excited to tell you stuff. And so the volume, not the volume of the, the audible volume, but the volume of information tends to grow over time. So I've been gone like for two weeks. So I've got a lot to tell you. In homiletic classes. Homiletics is a, a science or an art of delivery, of making a presentation. When you go to seminary, you take homiletics classes. They teach you how to preach. And they all tell you the same thing. You need to have like three, out, three points to your outline. Get them in, get them out, send them home. Don't give them too much because they can only handle three. So I have a, th I have a three point outline for you today. The only problem is I have four of them. And so you're going to get like 12 ideas, four different three-point outlines. So my homiletics professor would be very proud of me, but he'd also say, you should have done this on four different weekends. Anyway, you're the advanced church in the whole world, right? So you can handle this. <laughs> All right, settle down. Here we go. Number one, number one, three-point outline. Number one point, Jesus gives ministry to his church. Now, we learned that toward the beginning of Mark. We already knew that. And we know that anyway because it's systemic to who we are as a church at HTC. We have been given ministry by Christ. Now, at the beginning of Mark 6, he gave his disciples the opportunity to do what he did. Jesus, what did Jesus do? We read the story four different times, four different photo albums. And every time we flip through a page, we see miracles, we see uh, teaching, we, we see conversations, we see an intentional Jesus. Okay, now what Jesus does in Mark 6 is he sends the disciples of 12 guys out by twos. So if you can do the math on the fly, you know we got six groups. <laughs> you knew that already. The advanced church, six groups of two going out and doing what? Healing, teaching, essentially doing what Jesus did. Jesus says, I'm going to send you guys out. You've been watching me. You've heard what I've taught. You've watched how I minister. I am now going to give you authority, spiritual authority, supernatural spiritual authority to represent me, okay? So they did. In verse 12, they preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons. They anointed many sick people uh, with oil and, and healed them. You guys, this is a pattern that Jesus is going to continue to follow for over 2,000 years. He gifts us. He gives us spiritual gifting where we now have the authority of the Holy Spirit, the authority that Jesus gives us through the presence of his Holy Spirit to be really powerful in something or some things. He, he gives ministry to us. And he not only gifts us with spiritual gifts, he gives us anywhere from 8 to 15 people supernaturally and strategically placed in our lives and the Greeks called that group an oikos. All right, so we have our own people that we are now ministering to through the power of the Holy Spirit of God because Jesus gave us those gifts. He gives us spiritual authority. Okay, so that's really important. You don't have to be afraid to engage your oikos. You don't have to be afraid to recognize how God has gifted you and to go out, not two by two, not in Palestine, not as one of the 12, but he still does that for us today. We are now powerfully ministering in Jesus' name because he doesn't just have us watch him minister. He says, I want you to partner with me. I want you to have a piece of this action. I want you to see this is... This is powerful stuff. And that reinforces for us just how great it is to be a follower, a partner with Jesus. Okay? So that's point number one. Now point number two, this is the reason we don't have to be afraid. Um, yeah, not yet. Point number two. There we go. 
I was a little confused for a second. Jesus gives concern to the enemy. He gives ministry to you, and he gives concern to the enemy. What does that mean to give concern to the enemy? The enemy's upset. The enemy's bothered. The enemy's frustrated. The enemy is scared of us. We are intimidated by the world. This is the funniest thing. We are intimidated by the world, and it's the world who is afraid of us. That, uh, go figure. And, and the world should be intimidated by Jesus, not scared of Jesus. But it is intimidating when you recognize somebody has that kind of spiritual authority. And you're like not on his side. I mean, that's a scary place to be, on the wrong side of Jesus. So we have the 12 sent out by twos, six groups. Now, it's not just an itinerant Jewish rabbi who's like out there, you know, doing what a lot of solo rabbis did in that day. But now we have not just Jesus, now we got six groups of two Jesuses who are doing this stuff. And so what happens is, is Herod, King Herod, the Jewish king, who's a poor excuse for a king. He's not even a religious Jew. He's a secular Jew who, because of familial connections, was given the throne to monitor what goes on in Palestine under the thumb of the Roman Empire. But Herod's a bad guy. He's not even a good leader. He's not even a good guy. He's, he's just, he's not, he's not anybody you'd want your daughter to date. Anyway, so at this point now, we're learning that Herod, not that you would have let her date him, but now Herod is, is scared. Why? Because we got these guys that are like little Jesuses walking around. And now when he heard about the ministry of the 12, what he was afraid of is one of the guys he had killed, you've heard of him, John the Baptist, Herod had him beheaded at a big banquet. And now he's afraid, and this is what Mark says in verse 14, he's afraid that Herod, uh, or Herod is afraid that John the Baptist has come back to life. That's scary stuff. When you start thinking that the guy you executed is back, I mean, that's like Halloween kind of scary, right? And so Herod's freaking out. Now, at this point in the narrative in Mark 6, Mark decides to tell the story of Herod having beheaded John the Baptist, even though it didn't take place in the chronological sequence right now. He's elevating Herod's fear level based on what the 12 did. Herod's fear level now is he's talking about and he says, and he's afraid because remember, he killed John the Baptist and now he thinks John's back. Okay, but this is the cool thing about the contrast. We now get to the, the tale of two meals. Because what we're going to see in chapter 6 is a contrast between two meals. As he reflects back on this banquet where he had John beheaded, he's got all the fat cats, all the bureaucrats, all the really powerful people, the beautiful people, all the people who are supposed to be really important. They are now behind the walls of this fortress having this incredible banquet. I can only imagine how great that food was. Because when, even if you're a bad king, you have access to what's best out there. You know, the best cuts of meat, best veggies, best food, best the land has to offer. You're able to leverage in all of these little banquets that you throw, all these little parties you throw for all these really important people, right? And it was during that banquet that John the Baptist was beheaded. But there's a second meal that he's going to talk about now. We call it the feeding of the 5,000. And it isn't a real beautiful spread of all types of different, you know, entrees and salads and desserts. It's a pretty simple meal. And it's not given to people behind the fortress walls of a palace. It's given to a lot of people out sitting in a meadow. Now, I can't help but recognize the contrast Mark is painting here. Because Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of Hades will not be able to hold us back. You see, when we get to the 5,000 in a minute, it's almost like a military army, an army on military maneuvers. And they're on the move. And while the world is securely positioned in their safe little walls, Jesus is now not just one guy, not just 12 guys, Jesus is now marshalling an army of thousands of people who are going to take apart that fortress. Not physically. I mean, they're not all going to eat their meal and then 
march against Herod's palace. All I'm saying is that spiritually, the symbolic value of this contrast is pretty impressive. And so we have in uh, verse 30. Here we go, verse 30. The apostles gather around Jesus to report to him all that they had done and taught. And what had they done? They, people repented. Uh, they responded to the message of Jesus. They were healed. Demons were cast out. And so they were jacked up. And then in verse 31, because so many people were coming and going, they didn't have a chance to eat. Jesus says to the 12 fellows, he says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place, get some rest. I mean, ministry is exhausting. Jesus here is giving them permission to take a break because when there's so many people, and, and this is funny, they go away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Look at verse 33. But many who saw them leaving recognized him and ran on foot from all the towns and got to where they were going ahead of them. I mean, they wanted to be healed. They wanted to have their demons cast out. They wanted to have miracles too. So these guys are having a hard time getting a break. And Jesus says, come away and rest. And then verse 34, Jesus landed, saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them. Now, this is the linchpin verse for what our talk is today, our presentation is today, because today we're describing the art of compassion. So we'll get to the compassion in a minute. Just want you to understand that this now all kind of helps us see what's going on the rest of the way. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began teaching them many things. Now, compassion as a shepherd is an interesting thing, and we'll talk about what the word actually means in a minute. But I want to contrast those two meals. You've got the fat sheep <laughs> behind the fortress walls, right? I mean, these are the real important people. These are the guys making the decisions. These are the, these are the trendsetters in that culture. They're, they're the ones everybody's intimidated by. By the way, while they're having their banquet with their own little fat sheep in their banquet, they're afraid of what's going on outside at that other meal where the weak sheep are meeting, okay? Because it, I, most of the guys I'm reading on this passage, they think that Mark is elevating Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 20. And this is what we call a messianic prophecy. That is what, when the Messiah, Jewish Messiah comes, and we know that he was Jesus, this is what his ministry is going to be like. So what does he say, the prophet Ezekiel say in Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 20? Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says to them. See, I myself will judge between the fat sheep, you know, those guys, and the lean sheep. Because you fat sheep shove with your flank and your shoulder and all the strong sheep, you know, they're getting, all the good, they're getting all the good food because they're the ones that are big and burly and they're making the decisions and it's all about them and they're pushing the weak sheep out of the way, butting all the weak sheep with your horns until you've driven them away. But there's a shepherd who's coming who's gonna say this, I'm gonna save my flock and those weak sheep, they're not gonna be plundered anymore. I mean, that's like so over. Bless you. I will judge between one sheep I will judge between one sheep and another sheep. I'll place over them one shepherd, my servant David. See, that's why this is messianic. Because the, the house of David was, was the one that was going to, at some point in the future, deploy the Messiah. And he will tend them, and he'll tend them to be their what? What does it say? Shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God. My servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. You got the fat sheep, you got the skinny sheep. I'm going to come and I'm going to save the skinny sheep from the fat sheep. And the fat sheep are pretty intimidated by that. Here's number three. Jesus gives direction to the lost. This is the first of our three-point outlines. Jesus gives direction to the lost. Now, compassion, we're going to find today, compassion means direction. You don't have compassion for people until you're... you're you're feeling the compassion that's required at the level that the shepherd feels compassion for sheep who are lost. Compassion is an interesting word in the Greek, and it's the word that shows up here. Splunknitsomai is the word. Let's say it out loud together. No, I'm just kidding. You, <laughs> you, might, not, you might not get it. The, the, what it. What it means is this word compassion literally means to have my bowels yearn. Let's say that out loud together. No, let's not. 
Splankna, splankna, which is the root of this term, it means internal organs. And this is how the Greeks thought. The Greeks thought that emotion did not exist in the heart. We talk about loving with our heart. That's not how they talk. They talked about uh, loving with my intestines. I'm not saying you should try this at home. I'm not saying you go home to your sweetheart and say, I love you with all my bowels. That would not... But the point I think we need to get here is this. When you are wanting to help someone badly enough, you start to cramp up about it. You get a touch of the nausea. You grab the, the tums or the rollades. Because you, you remember that crush you had when you fell in love the first time? And I hope there's still that, you know, those butterflies with your beloved now that you're experiencing even years later. But you couldn't even sleep. You couldn't sleep. It was just so, I mean, it just so overwhelmed you. And maybe it's not even a positive emotion. Maybe it is a fear or a concern. And so now you're afraid for someone and you're actually sick to your stomach over it. You know what that means? That means you're feeling it at a gut level. That's what compassion is. Feeling something that much. And what Jesus gives when, when he's feeling that for someone, he gives them direction. I just want you to know something. If you guys are frustrated today because you don't have direction and you're confused about something, you have a shepherd who is feeling what you're feeling at a splankna level. Jesus is sick to his stomach over the fact that you can't find your way because nobody loves the sheep like the shepherd. And that's an important thing to understand. Jesus is always giving direction to sheep. He just loves them that much. All the way through his earthly ministry. You remember that story that we read? And it's not a, a fictional story. I mean, it actually took place. It's the Last Supper in John 14. It's very famous because it's where we get our, our communion experience from. And Jesus said to the fellows, he said, you know the place where I'm going. And then Thomas chimes in. He says, nah, I don't think that's factually correct. We don't know where you're going. How can we know where you're going? And Jesus said... I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Constantly, 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 always giving direction to people because that's what shepherds do for sheep. And by the way, sheep, sheep, the life of a sheep is hard life. And the reason is because sheep are stupid. <laughs> you talk to people who know animals, know the animal kingdom, they'll say of all of the animals they know personally, it's those sheep that have fewer neural connections firing on, you know, all cylinders all the time. Their, their ability to process is so much less um, than the ability many animals have to process. You, how many of you think life is hard? Raise your hand, please. Life is hard. The rest of you living in denial? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> okay, if you raise your hand because you admit life is hard, you know why life is hard? Because you're a sheep. I'm a sheep. That's why life is hard. It just is. And we always, have, we always have this need. You see, compassion that Jesus shows is not just emotion. It's not just, I feel badly for you. Compassion that is what a shepherd feels is this. How can I help you find your way? It began by Jesus saying to the disciples, what, what did the disciples need? They needed rest. They were exhausted. It's hard to take a break when you are cranking ministry on all cylinders and people are benefiting and say, oh, we just love what you're doing. Can you do some more? How do you say no to that? And Jesus said, fellas, come on, you got to rest. He gave them direction by giving them the freedom to take a break. You know why? Because he loved them. He had compassion on them. And now he's going to give direction, not because people need rest, but because people need food. We're going to get to the second meal in a minute. Anyway, okay, verse 35. I digress here. By, by this time, it was late in the day. Disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something to eat. I mean, Jesus, you've got to let these people go. You're the guy with the microphone. Come on, tell them. Go, go. You're teaching, right? You're on the podium. Got to take a break. Let them have a break. <laughs> you send them away. And I love verse 37. Jesus looks at the 12 guys and what does he say? You give them something to eat. <laughs> you know why that's beautiful? Is because what, what's the first point? 
Jesus, what? Gives ministry away. He tells us that all the time. We say, oh God, will you help him? He looks at you and says, you help him. I've given you spiritual authority. I've given you spiritual gifts. I've given you your own eight to 15 people. You help them. Because we can now. And then they said, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are you gonna, are we gonna go and spend that much on bread and give it to them? And then, so it's right back on Jesus. That's the inference. No, a ball's in your court. And Jesus, he just passes it right back to him. How many loaves do you have? Not how many loaves do I have? How many loaves do you have? And what do they look at each other? I don't know. I don't know how many loaves we have. And what does he say? Go find out. And so they did. We said they're obedient. They did. They go and they find out and they come back and they say, I got some good news, got some bad news. Good news is we found some food. Bad news is it's like five dinner rolls and two little fish. And we got a lot of people. And then Jesus directs, all, directs him. This is what I want you to do. Have all the people sit down in groups. I love this story. Sit down in groups on the green grass. And they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. And he took the five loaves, two fish, looked up to heaven, gave thanks, broke the loaves, and then gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. And the number of men who had eaten was 5,000, which says may have been far more than that, may have eaten in total. Okay, great story. Got to break it down. We got more three-point outlines to give you. Let's talk about need. What is need? By definition. One more. Need, by definition. Need occurs when the solution exceeds the resources. How many times have you, well, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever been in need? Raise your hand, please. Okay, now you know why. Because you had a problem and the resources you had available were not sufficient to meet the problem. See, the solution exceeded the resource yet. Might have been a relational need. Uh, you, Lord, help me. Get me through this. I need more strength. The, my strength resources are not sufficient. <laughs> Hang in here. Might have been a financial need. I got a bill. Don't have enough in the bank. Whatever it is, you got a need when the solution exceeds resources. Okay, let's talk about compassion as it relates to need and giving direction. Here we go. Number one, here's our, our second three-point outline. Compassion solves problems. That's one of the things compassion does. It's not the only thing it does. It's one of the things it does. Now I'm going to start another three-point outline in the middle of this one. I told you I'd give you a boatload. Every time we come to a problem, you might say, I want to solve that problem. First question you have to ask is, is it a problem? Did you know that 92% of the problems that you think are problems aren't? Statistically. Come up with a list of problems. So we come up with a list of problems. And research, as, the, as that's analyzed, 92% aren't problems. Only 8% of the things you think are problems are actually problems. Sometimes we just have to ask the question, is it really a problem? Then the next question is this. If we determine it's in the 8%, is it worth solving? You know, some problems are not worth solving. It's just better to have the problem. Because if you solve the problem, what are you going to create? Man, more problems. You're going to solve a bigger problem. I'll give you an example. I have a problem. Pastor Tom has a problem. I have an issue. I've got a ton of them, but anyway, let me tell you about one of them. I'm an introvert, and, and that's, that's how I test. That's how I feel. That's how I am. People who know me know that I'm an introvert. I'm a very private person. I, I can't, I, naturally, I just can't stand being in crowds. Okay, no, so what's my problem? It's not that I'm an introvert. My problem is y'all. <laughs> See, I'm an introvert in a large crowd all the time. I mean, we just have large crowds that we deal with and groups of people, and the Lord takes me out of this large crowd, and he sends me to other places to talk to other large crowds. One of the most awkward things ever. I'm just, I'm, I, I was talking to a guy this morning, got baptized. In, in the earlier service. And he, you know, shared his testimony. And back there, we're chatting, and he said, man, stand on that stage is scary. I said, welcome to my world, bro. <laughs> after all these years, truly, after all these years, you ask me how I'm feeling. I'm sweating back there before I come out and talk to you. I'll do this four times this weekend. And every time, I will be scared to death before I sit down in the seat. Because that's my personality. Now, I can solve that problem. 
I could say, see you later. I could solve that problem. I'd go find a small church or get out of the ministry completely. I can solve that problem. But to solve it would create for me what? A bigger problem. I'd be out of God's will. That's the biggest problem anybody ever had. So I don't want to solve that problem. The apostle Paul, he, he talked about his problem. Look at this. In, when he wrote the Corinthian church, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, he said, I, got, I had these surpassingly great revelations. Now, I'm not going to tell you what they were because I don't know what they were. He, didn't, he couldn't tell us what they were. He was not allowed to speak about them because he was allowed to go into the third heaven. And you know what the third heaven is? It's the one right after the second heaven. The first heaven is the atmosphere. The second heaven is like outer space. And then there's like the capital H heaven. I don't know where that is. I don't know what that looks like. I'm just telling you, I've never been there. Paul went there. And when he left there, God said, don't tell anybody what you saw here. They would have no frame of reference and just mess them up. That was the Apostle Paul. Of course, there are a lot of people these days that claim they, and they did, and they're all excited about telling us. Anyway, the Apostle Paul said he couldn't. And so, but how do you feel when you leave the throne of God? I'm not talking about being invited into the Oval Office. I'm talking about going into the office of the most powerful person in the world, the throne room of God. And then God's saying goodbye, you know, shake hands. Okay, you've got to go back to your life now. And you're walking out of there feeling pretty good about yourself. I mean, how many people get to do that? That was, that, was, that was great. So therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. I have to deal now with some kind of physical problem just to remind me I have to be on my knees every day and not think too highly of myself. I asked God three times to take that thorn in the flesh away from me. And three times, every time he told me what? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. See, Paul had a problem. He was sick. But to resolve the problem would have created a bigger problem. Then we'd have a conceited apostle. That's a big problem. And so even though Paul asked God to solve the problem, God decided, I don't think I want to solve that problem. You just create a bigger one. But let's say that you do have a problem and it is worth solving. Here's the third point of this three-point outline. Does God want to use you to solve it? Sometimes there's a problem that should be solved, just not by you. God might want to solve it directly himself. I don't know. God might want to use somebody else to solve it. All I'm saying is just because you see a problem and you're compassionate doesn't mean you're the one that's going to have to solve the problem or feel guilty when you cannot. And remember our definition of need. We got a problem when the solution exceeds the resources. Now, because I'm going to give you another three point outline here, but the reason is because it's systemic to our story. There are three levels of how people perceive a need. Here we go. Level one need is when you have no resources, but you got an idea as to where those resources that you need might be. That's a level one need. You, you got nothing in terms of resources, but you got an idea where you can get them. Now, here we come to the difference between Mark's photo album, his snapshot of the feeding of the 5,000, and John. Remember I told you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all keep that picture in their photo album. So now we look at John's picture, and it gives us a little more detail, a little more clarity. There are a couple of apostles, a couple of the disciples, that Mark says spoke up. But John identifies who they were. <laughs> In Mark's account, though, in Mark 6, 37, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, that'd take more than half a year's wages. That's what they said to him. John tells us who they, who they is. And you know who it was? A guy named Philip. Phil said it. You know why? Because Phil's the pessimist among the 12. He, from the very beginning, he knew it was impossible. And you know what a pessimist is, don't you? It's an optimist with experience. That's what a pessimist is. <laughs> And evidently, Philip had been around the block a few times, and he's checking this thing out, and he's saying, there's no way. No way can we feed these guys. He was actually a local. He was from nearby Bethsaida. So he's the guy that knows where all the fast food places are in town. There's just no, but, no way. Nobody's going to be able to feed all these people. But he's not just the pessimist, and he's not just the local. He's also the stats guy. Are you a stats guy? Okay. Think the last time you went to Disneyland. Did you enjoy that time? Or were you thinking about how much money Disney's making that day? 
right? It's like, oh, it's about 100 bucks a head, 50 bucks for lunch, nothing going to buy souvenirs. These guys are making millions of dollars here today. Is that you? Yeah, right? All the wives look at their husbands saying, that's you, man. That's, you can't even enjoy a day with your children because you're, you're trying to figure out how much more money those guys are making than you're making. Point is, Phil is a stats guy. He's the guy that says, you know, it would take eight months' salary to feed that many people. A day's wage back then was a denarius. And if a guy worked six days and then rested one, which is how you would have expected them, that's how they operated. It wasn't a five-day work week. They worked six days. They rested on the Sabbath. And if, if a guy worked for a denarius a day, six days a week, you know how long it would take in order to pay for a lunch that big? It would take over half a year's salary. And nothing's changed. If we, if, we have, if we want to feed that many people and we call the fish and chips catering service and order 10 to 12,000 box lunches, you know what it would take? About six to eight months of your salary. So it's still true. But this is the thing. Philip had no idea. Yeah, excuse me. He had no resources and he had no ideas. But he had a friend. And the problem was this. He forgot the friend. That's the problem we all have. We forget who's also in the conversation. His name is Jesus. Level two need, where you have no resources, you have no ideas, but you got friends. You got friends. You have no idea how to get the resources, but you got friends who might. I have friends. <laughs> A lot of friends. I work with some very competent, smart people here at HDC. One of those guys, one of many there's a guy named George. Some of you know Pastor George. He's been with us for a long time. Love George. George's one of the smartest dudes you'll ever meet. He just knows stuff. And he knows everything. It just seems like he knows everything. I mean, I'm not saying he's waiting for a vacancy in the triune Godhead. I'm just, I'm just saying he's a, he's a really smart guy. So this last week, the two of us are in a conversation. The other guy is asking questions about High Desert Church. So he asked me questions because I'm the senior pastor, right? Yeah, that's a logical guy to ask a question of. He asked me the question. I said, George? George answers the question. He asked me another question. George answers the question. Finally, I said to the guy, you know, I don't need to know anything. I just need to know George. <laughs> and some of you are feeling like uh, you don't have resources, you don't have ideas. And actually, you don't need the resources. And you don't need ideas as long as you know Jesus. Andrew was the optimist. That's the second disciple that John identifies for us. Phil was the pessimist. Andrew's the optimist. Look at verse, um, in John chapter 6, verse 8, it says, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. This is after the exchange with Philip. And you can tell Andrew is an optimist. He says, well, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. And then that comma right here, that comma, that's where realism kicks in. And he concludes that statement by, <laughs> just see, you can just see his countenance fall. Oh, here's a boy. I found five small barlows and two small fish. But how far will that go among many? <laughs> you ever been there? You ever try to keep up your hope? Be optimistic? Just know. I know God's in this. I know He's coming through, you know. I know we're going to figure this out. And then realism kicks in, and you lose that clarity, and you become discouraged. Andrew was, let's give it our best shot, okay? <laughs> in fact, in the Greek, the word for boy is a double diminutive, which means that it was a little boy, probably a young little boy. And by looking at what he brings to the table with those little loaves and those two, the barley loaves, by the way, that's a cheap, that's a cheap loaf. And the two little fish, this is not just a, a young little boy. This is a poor little boy. We use that term, oh, poor little boy. This is a poor little boy. And you can hear his optimism tail spinning when realism kicks in. What's a level three need? It's where you have no resources, no ideas, and you have no friends. If you ever reach that point, you're in big trouble. But this is my question to you. If you know Christ, will you ever reach that point? No. That's the thing, you guys. Phil, this is not a conversation between you and Andrew. It's a conversation between you and Andrew 
and Jesus. He's got resources, he's got ideas, and he's your friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. Anyway, compassion solves problems, but sometimes we can't solve problems. Here we go. Next one. Compassion also supports people. See, if you can't solve the problem, you can still support the people. Look at verse 39 of Mark 6. And Jesus directed them, have all people sit down in groups on the green grass. I love this, I love this, I love this. Look at this. He could have said, Mark could have said, then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the grass. But he had to throw in that little caveat, that little detail. The green grass. Why? Because he's talking about this compassion that the shepherd has for the sheep. What Old Testament psalm do you think of when you think of a shepherd. Psalm 23. You remember it from the last funeral you attended. The Lord is my shepherd. And watch this. He makes me lie down. I, I don't even have to put this on screen. You know this. He makes me lie down in what kind of pastures? Okay. Now remember the cerebral capacity of a sheep? You know what a shepherd has to do for a sheep? He'll bring them to a meadow. He'll have to kick their legs out from under the lead sheep so that the sheep will actually fall down. That I, he makes me lie down. He's, the shepherd is making the sheep lie down because the sheep is like standing up saying, hey, we're, we could never feed this many people. Bam! Knock his legs out from under. Sheep's nose hits the green grass and goes, oh, <laughs> you know what that is? You know what that is? That's, that's us. That's what that is. He makes us lie down in the green grass. What is Jesus telling these guys? Y'all get ready because the in and out wagon is about to roll up. <laughs> so they sit down in groups of hundreds and fifties. And I'm sure when they're sitting down in groups of hundreds and fifties, the disciples are looking at each other like, why are we doing this? What's going to happen if all of a sudden In-N-Out shows up and you guys aren't organized? It's going to be chaos. It's going to be bedlam. You're going to, you're going to knock, the, they're going to roll the truck right out of here. We have to get organized. We can't, you guys, you 12 guys, you HTC guys, you can't solve the problem, but you can get organized. You can support the people while Jesus figures out a way to solve the problem. I always used to tell my players, I used to have players. They were first graders. I'm a championship basketball coach, by the way. Undefeated season. And these little first graders playing, playing basketball. And what does a first grade basketball game look like? Ten kids jumping up saying, pass me the ball, pass me the ball, pass me the ball. So whenever we'd practice, Coach Tom, he'd have his whistle. He blows the whistle. And everybody, every one of these kids knows when Coach Tom blows the whistle, you just freeze. And you hold the ball and you listen to what Coach Tom is going to say. Because it's going to be profoundly important. And I look at, they're all saying, pass me the ball. And I look at this one kid. He's like 40 feet away from the basket. And I, I said, what did you say? I said, I'm open. <laughs> I said, of course you're open. You're 40 feet away from the basket. Nobody's going to guard you out here. I said, why do you want the ball? He says, so I can shoot it. I said, you're six. There's no way you can score right now. No, we'd be stupid to pass you the ball. You need to put yourself in a position to do something with a ball when it's passed to you. I'd say that same, I'd say the same thing to you guys. And that's what Jesus is telling the, the disciples. Oh, I'm going to give them lunch. But they're not ready for it. You got you to gotta support these guys. We got to put them in groups. What happens? If there's no logistical support, even Jesus resolving the problem is chaotic. That's why he partners with these guys. That's why he gives ministry away. That's why he gives it away to you. Here we go, number three. Last point of the day, by the way, compassion begins with gratitude. Compassion begins with gratitude. This is the best part to me. He takes the five loaves and the two fish. Jesus looks up to heaven. He gave thanks, and he broke the loaves. Mark chapter 6, verse 41. What did he do? Watch this. He took, he, 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 took, he took these five little rolls of barley bread and two 
sardines. And he holds them up to God and says, Lord, thank you for this food. What's the lesson there? Be thankful for what you have, not for what you hope to get. Be thankful for what you have, even though you know that it will not meet the need completely. You guys, we're so ungrateful because we don't have everything that we need right now. God says, well, what do you have right now? Remember that line? You feed them. So we can't feed them. How much food you got? We only have five loaves and two fish. Give me the five loaves and the two fish. Let's be thankful for it. <laughs> you imagine the looks on their faces when he's praying for the five loaves and the two fish. All 12 guys. Have you ever supposed to have your eyes closed when you're praying, but you're kind of looking around? I know you have, so admit it. And I'm sure the guys are going... But that's the problem. God can't use us to provide for the needy because we're not thankful people ourselves. We're greedy people. And most of us would say, I'll be thankful, God, when you show me the money. And God says, you got any money? What money do you have? And he would say, hold that money up and be thankful for it. And then the picture we see is not one of Jesus, you know, putting all, you know, saying, okay, and, you know, he puts the little loaves down and the little fish there and he puts his purple scarf over it and he goes shazam and throws some gold dust in the air and pulls it away. And, you know, now we got this big pile of food. This is the way it happens. He gave to them, to his disciples, the bread and the fish, distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. Kofinos is the Greek term for the basketfuls. They were large baskets. Twelve large baskets would hold 400 pounds of food. Everybody ate, and this is the way it works. Line up. Twelve guys line up. Come on, Phil, you're first. And Jesus has the bread, and he's got the fish. And he starts handing Phil some food, and Phil now has got a lot of food, and he says, go distribute to that 50 over there, and then Andrew. And he keeps handing out the food. And Andrew goes to the next group of 100. Oh, come on, John. And he, he keeps giving. He keeps handing food. He's not running out of food. And then when all 12 guys have come through the line, Phil's back. And he's at the end of the line, and he shows up for a second trip. And Jesus is still handing out the food. And Phil's thinking, this is nuts. And Jesus is thinking, I told you it was nuts. <laughs> Things get crazy when I'm in the conversation, Jesus said. Can you imagine what Phil was thinking like the 428th time he came through? Looks at Jesus and he says, we're going to feed them all, aren't we? And Jesus said, yeah, we are, Phil. And when we're done, we're going to have 400 pounds of food left over because that's the way I roll. <laughs> and you guys... I've been in a lot of these conversations where Cheryl and I would talk about money. Or when we talk about raising kids. Or when we talk about our own marriage. And it's so easy to forget that that conversation is never between Tom and Cheryl. It's between Tom and Cheryl and Jesus. And when we're out of resources and when we're out of ideas, we always have a friend who has both. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would give us that confidence in who you are and what you would love to be for us, a shepherd who feels so deeply for us because we need direction. And may we, Lord, not only look to you when we look to you for what we need, but would we also be willing to support the people around us while they're looking to you? 
And, and would we always be thankful? With everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed, some of you, your problem is not lunch, it's hell. Your problem is hell. And the shepherd came to lead you, the weak sheep, into an eternity with God forever. Just an amazing opportunity that the cross of Christ affords us all to be forgiven of our sin and to be given the gift of eternal life. And we talk about admitting that you're a sheep without a shepherd and believing that Jesus is the shepherd who can lead you and choosing to follow him, choosing to place your faith in Jesus. Just praying right now where you are sitting, Jesus, I choose you. I admit I can. I admit you, I believe you can and I, I choose you to lead me, not just into heaven, but to lead every conversation I have this week. And would you be my friend, the friend I need when I'm out of everything else? In Jesus' name, all God's children said.